Hi everyone. This week we are going to talk about chapter 6, technical reports and documents. Remember that most of the writing you're going to do in the workplace will be correspondence and it's pretty personal even if it's relating to business issues. But when we start tackling reports you'll find that those are addressed more generally. So even if addressed to a primary reader, it may be duplicated and distributed organization-wide. So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at report structure and types of reports. So reports on completed tasks, reports on current tasks, reports on future tasks, specifications. So these are two documents, um, technical or performance standards, and lab reports. So remember there is a structure to reports and you want to look at it with this kind of structure. So we look at summary, context, details, and next step. Um, <clears throat> if you go back to conversation, what happened briefly, um, context is why are you telling me this? What's this got to do with me? Details are more along the lines of Tell me exactly what happened. And next step would be, what have you done about it? What do you need me to do? Or if the person needs the story. Um, so the story would be if it's a summary, the condensed version of events. Um, the context would be how the document came to be written and provides the context. The details are the relevant facts and findings of the case and the next step is what happens next, what you've done and or what you need the reader to do. So if you have a, a conversation, that would be the structure, but here you're telling a story. So if you are doing an inspection or an assessment report, Here is the structure of that report. And I do want to remind you that typically it's best to save the summary as the last thing that you write. That might seem counterintuitive since it's the first piece of the report in the structure. However, um, it's often easier if you can do the rest of the report and then summarize simply because it's easier to summarize once you already know what you've said in the report. So if you think about that, it makes more sense that way, but to just hear it, it doesn't. So first thing you want to do as far as context goes is explain what did you inspect? So state your purpose and what authority you had. And how does the inspection fit into the larger context of our business or project? Um, you want to make sure that you indic indicate your project number, client's name, location, date, time, duration, other people involved, and any other relevant establishing detail. What was your overall initial impression? Did you find any deficiencies? And then the next step. Does the inspected object or project pass inspection? What kind of follow-up is required? Then go back to your summary. What did you inspect and for what purpose? So once you have all the other information, then it's going to be easier to write that summary and say, here in summation is what I found, and give that brief overview once you've got everything else in place. So here we're taking a look at an example of an inspection of Pennington Muse for water ingress. If you want to take a minute and pause and read through it, that might be helpful. So here you see the summary. This provides the gist of what was inspected, what was found, and what they think should happen next. Then there are two paragraphs of context, so how the report came to be written, 
Um, and keep in mind too, if it's appropriate to have two paragraphs, uh, go ahead and make it two paragraphs just because it says a paragraph doesn't mean if structurally it needs to be two, you have to only stick to one. So use your editing skills for that. Next we have that general overview or the impression of the object being inspected to help make sense of the inspection process and findings. Then the methodology and that creates credibility for the results. So here they're going to spell out, hey, here's what we did. Here's how we got to where we were. So during the inspection, here's how we got the results that we got. And then lists and tables make the deficiencies easy to find and follow up on. And then finally, the results are interpreted for a non-technical audience. So this report will be read not just by Mike, but also by the Strata Council. So keep in mind too, perhaps not everybody who gets a hold of this information is going to be a highly technically skilled person. Um, so at some point you have to make sure that the information comes across in a way that everybody can understand. So I might be part of city council. This might be something that I need to understand. And I might be interested in your results, but I may not understand everything that you've got there. So at the end of the day, I might just need to know, hey, what is your ultimate recommendation? And here you're saying, I recommend the Strata Council of Pennington Muse conduct a more thorough investigation of the extent of fungal growth within the structure and the structural damage that may already have taken place. It's quite clear the remediation work will be required. So clearly more work needs to be done to understand the full extent of the damage. Um, and if that's all I need to know, then that's all I need to know. That's fine. So here's our example. If you want to take a minute and pause to read through, you certainly can. But in the beginning here we have our summary. So this explains what happens next to get the job done. Here's the context as to where, when, why, and with whom. Uh, the scope of the work. Um, filing and billing information and so on so that it's clear what all went on. So if anybody questions why the trip occurred, we can pull this and say here's what's happened. And the work done, um, this is chronological. It's easy to follow. So here was the issue. Here's exactly what happened day by day. The first paragraph answers the question, what did you get done according to plan? Here's the discussion on what did you get done that required workarounds? What did you not get done and why? And then what needs to happen next to get the job done? So, as you can see, Pretty straightforward, probably didn't take hours. Um, part of this, of course, is keeping track of what you're doing when you're on the job site. Uh, also, I would always say make sure you're keeping receipts and invoices and things like that when you're off on trips and doing work on off-site locations as well. And then we have an incident or accident report. Hopefully you are not part of too many of these. If you are, um, if you are, there's typically forms you fill out, but if not, and you're asked to just type one of these up, here's a good rule of thumb. What happened and what are the consequences as your summary? You want to make sure that you provide just enough context to make sense of the situation. Your context would be to what project or work task or function does this accident relate? Again, you need to make sure you include the project number, client name, location, date, time, duration, other people involved, um, what actions led up to the incident, and then the incident itself. What exactly happened? Provide the play-by-play. -play. And the next step, what have you done and what still needs to be done by you or someone else as a result of the incident? And then also note, what steps could be taken to prevent this from happening again? Here we have an example. Um, this is a report on damage to work truck 17. 
So summary answers the most important questions. What happened and how does this affect the project? So bear damage. It happens, I suppose. And the context. Um, this is going to describe the project or situation that the incident disrupted. And then it contains the information that can be filed um, and used for reference should the client question the damage, um, the charges for damage, or if anybody needs to reference this back. Next we have the incident section that tells the story of what happened and why. And again, um, it's chronological. If you note, there's not a lot of opinion. Uh, the person tries to stick to things pretty factually. The next step is also pretty chronological. It tells the story of what they did as a result of the incident and what still needs to be done and by whom. And then in the end, it just basically says, please let me know what you decide, and then lists the attachments um, and includes anything relevant that the person may need um, to make the quickest and easiest decision possible, but also to include with that report so that for future reference, should anybody have any questions, there's pictures of the damage, there's the off-road rentals invoice, and then a map to show precisely where the um, damage took place so that if anybody's questioning it, you can pull up the Google map and see that this took place in the middle of a forest, not in the middle of like an urban area where there's not likely to have been a grizzly bear. And next we have progress reports. So are you on a schedule and on a budget? If not, why not? And if appropriate, what are you doing about it? What's your revised completion date and your final cost? Um, Context on what project are you reporting, your purpose or goal, project number, client name, and then your actual progress. What have you what were you supposed to have done by now? What have you managed to get done? What workarounds, if any, were necessary to get things done? What have you not been able to get done and why not? Next up, what are you doing right now to deal with the problems? What are you planning to do to get back on schedule? What's your completed or what's your projected <laughs> completion date or final cost. If you're working in any kind of business and doing any kind of projects, chances are you're going to have to do progress reports. So this is a good one to familiarize yourself with. So here we have an example of occasional progress reports. Here you have a summary. Um, it notes that we are behind schedule, but we'll complete the overall project in time. Here you have the context that identifies the project and gives an idea of where they should be at this point. Progress, what have you got, got done, gotten done so far? And then what has not been done? You don't have to state the obvious as long as the information is clear. The why not doesn't need to be explained, however. In this case, no workaround was possible. So in this case, there is a forest fire. So clearly this isn't because the crew was out slacking or anything like that. You can't really work around a forest fire. So, you know, it, you can't offer up ridiculous, um, non-feasible solutions. So it it's, goes without saying. So it's best to just not have to do that. Um, so the next step, what have you done and what will you do to complete the project? So this person says, hey, we've worked 23 days straight. There's a forest fire, essentially. I'm going to go ahead and give the crew time off um, to visit their families. And I'm staying in town to monitor the situation. I'll call them back once the fire is under control. Because really, what else can you do in this situation? So he's making the best of the situation. We worked. There's nothing we can do. I'm using this to let them get their heads on straight. Um, re relax, recharge, then I'll call them back. And then next step, hey, unless it burns for three more weeks, we should still be able to get this done in plenty of time. I've done my due diligence, made sure everyone can get in. You know, things should be fine. So, but again, if it's not, 
he's kind of covered himself to indicate there's nothing I can do. It's a forest fire. And then you have your periodic progress report. So this is a semi-formal report. Um, they're often filed with pro in a project log and they may be written as standard reports rather than correspondence reports. So the progress report doesn't usually have addressing information. They're not to anyone in particular, they're just included as periodic progress reports just to note progress. So when you're writing these, your summary will answer the most important questions in about a tenth of the length of the rest of the report. Your context, um, you don't really need that. It, it's a report in a series that's filed together, so the context would be identical in each report. And then progress. Um, on complex projects, each subsection is written as a separate project report. And then each mini progress report answers all the usual questions. So it would note what was done, what required workarounds, the, what didn't get done and why, and what have you done or what are you going to get done about problems. And then in periodic progress reports, the next step section has a dual focus. One is on how to catch up on the work for the current reporting period and the other is a projection for the project as a whole. And the report's not addressed to anyone in particular, so it wasn't, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't written as a memo or letter report, but someone does have to take responsibility for it, so there is a signature block. So at the end of the day, somebody has to be responsible for having written this progress report. Next, we're going to look at proposals. And proposals are pretty important documents. The only way for companies and organizations to obtain contracts, research funding, project approvals, and so on are to submit proposals. They can come in different sizes, but quite often tend to be formal reports. And we'll get to those in the next chapter. Our types of proposals, internal proposal, um, and this is where the reader is already aware of your abilities and background, so it's not necessary to restate those. The reader may also be aware of the problem being solved by the proposal. It typically isn't as much writing. It's usually like in a memo format. And then there are external proposals. For these, uh, those are written for an outside organization. The reader doesn't necessarily know you or your abilities, and you will have to prove that you understand the problem being solved. They have much longer introductions. It requires a more thorough um, description of the problem and quite likely a description of your qualifications and background. So you really have to prove yourself. The other type of proposals, um, solicited proposal, personal request, or RFP, if you see that, it's a request for proposals. Um, the problem will generally have been described by the recipient asking for a solution. Often the recipient will have described the parameters for an appropriate solution. And you don't have to spend as much time describing the problem since they've already stated what it is. Your solution will still have to be described thoroughly, though, to prove that you can meet the requirements. And an unsolicited proposal. So with this, the recipient has not asked for a proposal. They may not even be aware that there is a problem. You will have to convince the recipient that you understand the needs of their organization. You will have to describe their problem thoroughly. You will have to describe your proposed solution thoroughly and convince them that it is achievable. So, how do you organize one of these? The following schematic is for the most complex and demanding type of proposal. And that would, of course, be the unsolicited and external proposal. So, you're making a proposal to someone who is not aware of your presence and for a problem they did not know even existed. And... I'll show you these sections, but keep in mind that sometimes circumstances will be different and you may not need all of the sections. So, summary, introduction, 
proposal, your solution, alternative solution, schedule, cost, qualification, references, next step. So the, your summary. Why is a change necessary and what do you plan to do about it? What are the main benefits that you're promising? Your introduction. This is going to also be context, what we've been calling context. What problem or current situation is the proposal meant to solve or improve? What specifically do you propose to do? Readers won't be convinced by what they don't understand. So here's where that clarity and conciseness comes in that we've been talking about all semester. What other solutions have you considered and why did you dismiss them? Your schedule. How will your changes be implemented and how will this affect our business? If I'm reading this. Costs. How much is this gonna cost me? How am I gonna get that money back over time? What's my return on investment? Qualifications and references. Okay, well, this sounds great, but how can I be sure that you're going to deliver on your promises? How do I know that you're not some fly-by-night scam artist? In the next step, recommend that your reader approve the project. Convince me. So, here we have an example this is an informal proposal sent through email. The summary provides the most important information in a very condensed form. We have a statement of the problem, and you notice they're using headings. Again, the headings format is great. It draws the eye, makes information easy to quickly identify. Alternative solutions, it comes before the proposed solution, and in this case, because it's already been tried, it's proven to be part of the problem. And here you have your proposed solution. Under technical details, we have a clear description of the problem, and it builds, their it builds your technical credibility and creates a desire for a solution. So kind of building that excitement shows you're knowledgeable about what you're discussing. In the next paragraph, we have a description of the benefits that helps the reader assess the solution against the cost. So kind of showing that, you know, regardless of what I'm going to hit you with next, which is the cost, keep in mind, here are all these benefits. So it's kind of warming them up to, to the pricing. Costs. So costs are itemized, and that shows that we've done our due diligence and that our number isn't an over the thumb estimate. So it shows credibility. You know, we've taken the time to go through and break everything down. We're not trying to overinflate costs, we're breaking everything down so that we are being very transparent. Here's our schedule. We're describing the implementation process and timeline, and that helps the person we're trying to convince. It helps them see that, hey, this is a really achievable, very doable thing. Next step. The final sentence is a subtle next step statement asking for approval. And you see, hey, I got an email from GE saying that they have all of it in stock, three weeks, and Two weeks for training and installation. If we can get this project completed, you know, five to six weeks turnaround time. No time at all, really. So all they're doing is just waiting for a yes. We can get this ordered. So very straightforward. And then some related reports. Closely related to proposals are some other reports that project future actions. Proposals seek to make a change or pursue a project, um, respond to a problem, purpose is to describe and sell a solution and answers the question, what should we do? An investigation report, um, this attempts to identify a problem in the first place. The purpose is to describe an experimental or research methodology and what it reveals. 
it will generally present a solution or recommend further study. Often when you clearly identify a problem, the solution suggests itself. It answers the question, what's the problem, or what is going wrong? There's also a recommendation report. And this kind of report compares several options and recommends one. So if your boss or supervisor or vice president or someone very high up comes to you and says, hey, we're looking at new systems or we need this new piece of equipment, can you write a recommendation report? This is what they're asking for. Um, for example, equipment, properties to develop, technology to adopt. It proves due diligence before major decisions. So it shows that to any major stakeholders who say, well, did you even think about this before you did it? Yes, here's our recommendation report. It answers the question, which of these options should we choose? So really, it's a side-by-side -side comparison of what we should pick. So you're basically exploring your options, looking at them, getting them down on paper, and then ultimately putting forth the one that you think is best. There's also a feasibility study. A feasibility study assesses the likelihood that a previously proposed idea, solution, or recommendation will succeed. Generally, this makes a yes or no recommendation, and it answers the question of whether or not should we do this. Specifications are something you might encounter um, depending on your field and this records absolute standards for equipment, processes, systems, and the like. It's used as reference documents for performance or suitability evaluation. Open specifications define performance requirements, what a system should do or be capable of. It allows suppliers to meet those requirements as they see fit. Um, for example, average fleet mileage requirements, also called functional or performance specs. There are closed specifications, and this specify um, exactly how something should be made or what components must be used. So, for example, for the sake of interoperability, you might specify specific operating software or a connection system. These are also known as restrictive specs. So, you have your general description and the object processor system as a whole, the scope, cost, start, and end dates, an overall definition, a definition of terms, and anything else that does not fit into the technical part-by-part -part specifications but is necessary to fully identify, limit, and define the purpose of the specifications, and then you have part-by-part -part description. So the technical specifications or requirements for all the component subsystems or parts of the object system or processes. And here you have an example. And I'm sure you've seen these at some point. So you have the scope of the specifications to what they apply and the parameters of their use. These are written sentence style specifications describing the specific requirements for all components of the systems. In this case, it's fire hydrants. You have numbered sections and subsections for easy reference. The specifications often refer the reader to specifications or details set down in other documents. And then here we have table by table specifications for BlackBerry smartphones. If you even remember what those are, they used to be popular. Um, and were at one time a competitor for the iPhone. 
On the left, you have lots of technical de data for um, technical readers. And on the right, you have highly graphical presentation for the actual consumer. So you can take a look at those if you want to pause for a moment. And then finally, we have lab reports. I know, this is the last one. Thank you for hanging in. Um, and these vary greatly from discipline to discipline. So of course, follow whatever format that your discipline dictates. Um, and they have a different purpose in school than in the work world. In school, you're generally repeating well-established procedures with expected results. So testing the constant of gravity or the boiling temperature of water at different atmospheric pressures. Your instructor will test you on how close you come to established values. In the work world, you're more likely to be testing new concepts and driving new data that people will use for new purposes. But all lab reports, of course, share the following overall organization. But again, how it's laid out and what's expected, those are conventions that you locate when you're actually in your place of business. So make sure that you get the feel for your place of work. So these are all the features that you will include. The abstract. Abstracts function like summaries, and these have purposes, key findings, and major conclusions. A little bit about your methodology is often common, um, and typically you'll also indicate if you reference any major um, publications or any other major people in your field. In your introduction, you'll describe the problem you're trying to solve and the hypothesis you're testing. Make sure you provide some background. Describe the experimental procedure or refer to a published one and the equipment and materials required. Next, cite and interpret your results, particularly their significance. Make sure you provide sample calculations and summary tables. And your conclusion. What can you know for sure as a result of the experiment? Suggest areas for further research. References. List all sources of information you drew upon to design, execute, and interpret the experiment. Then your appendices. Provide all the raw data to permit readers to review your results. Short lab reports don't require abstracts unless your instructor disagrees. The introduction introduces the experiment and its significance ends with a statement of the experiment's intent and scope. Here you have your list of equipment and materials. It's not always necessary, but it helps those who want to repeat your experiment. Here's your clear description. Make sure you write in first person, unless of course you're told not to. Here is your full data set. Here are your graphs and your conclusion, and that indicates the results. You might Im suggest improvements for future experiments and areas for further research. The discussion section interprets the results for the reader. And there you have it. Thanks for listening. I know that was kind of a long one, covered a lot of ground. And as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Have a good week.